This was work published at HPCA uh, this year in February. Uh, so this is also a very recent work, as you can see. And it is, it is uh, as far as we know, the state of the art uh, mechanism for defending against row hammer. Uh, it's called block hammer, uh, preventing row hammer at low cost by blacklisting rapidly accessed DRM rows. And Girai is going to present uh, this work, which he led. Girai, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh... I'll quickly move to the uh, executive summary. So in this work, uh, okay. Uh, in this work, we tackle Rohammer again uh, as a version in DRAM reliability and security problem. And uh, the, the problem we are tackling is that mitigation mechanisms have limited support for current and future DRAM chips. And uh, this has two components, basically. One is scalability uh, with version uh, Rohammer vulnerability. And uh, the second limitation of the uh, mitigation mechanisms is compatibility with commodity DRAM chips. And our goal, is, uh, goal here is to efficiently and scalably prevent raw hammer bit flips without knowledge of or modifications to DRAM internals. And uh, our key idea in this mechanism is to selectively throttle memory accesses that may cause raw hammer bit flips. And uh, our key mechanism here is called block hammer. Uh, Blockhammer tracks activation rates of all rows by using area efficient balloon filters, throttles row activations that could cause row hammer bit flips, and identifies and throttles the threads that perform row hammer attacks. And uh, by doing so, Blockhammer uh, provides a, 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 a full DRAM uh, secure, uh, full, full defense against row hammer uh, attacks. and. Uh, it, it is competitive with uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, raw hammer mecha mitigation mechanisms when uh, there is no attack, and uh, it is superior in performance and DRAM energy consumption when a raw hammer attack is present. Uh, and uh, we uh, we analyzed raw ha uh, block hammer in uh, uh, in various ways, and we show that. Uh, Block hammer uh, does not uh, require any proprietary information of DRAM internals and uh, no modifications to DRAM circuitry. Uh, so it is uh, both scalable and compatible uh, solution. Uh, okay, so I will uh, skip to skip DRAM background uh, to save some time and directly go to the motivation and goal. So uh, there are four high level raw hammer mitigation approaches that we can uh, identify in this work. Uh, in, in prior work. Uh, the first approach is to increase refresh rate uh, very naively, and which, uh, this, this reduces the refresh window and, and thus the activation count that an attacker can reach in a refresh window. Uh, the, the second uh, high-level approach is to physically isolate potential victim rows with sensitive data from aggressive rows that a potential attacker can uh, hammer. Uh, and uh, to do so, they uh, allocate isolation rows in between uh, these uh, victim and aggressor rows, such that the attacker cannot disturb sensitive data by performing raw hammer attack. And the third approach is a reactive refresh. Uh, in reactive refresh, uh, when an aggressor row is hammered, potential victim rows are refreshed to avoid bit flips. And uh, finally, the fourth approach uh, suggests throttling, the, throttling or slowing down the memory accesses uh, proactively, uh, such that no row's activation rate can reach to uh, row hammer threshold to induce row hammer bit flips. So uh, I will talk about two challenges all that, uh, that these uh, mitigation mechanisms are uh, facing. So the first challenge is scalability with worsening row hammer vulnerability. Uh, recent work show that DRAM chips become more vulnerable to raw hammer in the last decade, as I showed in the previous uh, presentation as well. So raw hammer, uh, raw hammer bit flips can occur in much lower activation counts, and hammer in a row can disturb more rows than before. And uh, furthermore, in DRAM mitigation mechanisms are shown to be ineffective, and therefore raw hammer is a more serious problem than ever today. And uh, to address this scalability, uh, worsening DRAM, uh, sorry, to address this worsening raw hammer vulnerability, uh, increasing refresh rate uh, approach requires refreshing all rows more frequently. And it's, it is not sustainable due to a large number of rows that needs to be refreshed. And 
the the second uh, high level approach physical isolation requires allocating more isolation rows which costs more DRAM capacity um, and uh, reactive refresh uh, needs refreshing more potential victim rows and uh, refreshing them more frequently uh, and proactive throttling uh, needs to slow down the system furthermore so uh, we conclude that uh, mitigation all, all these mitigation mechanisms face the challenge of scalability with Borson and Rohammer. Uh, the second challenge is compatibility with commodity DRAM chips. And uh, to understand this challenge, uh, uh, we need to revisit uh, how memory addresses are mapped to DRAM cells through several abstraction levels. In the, uh, in the application level, uh, we have virtual memory addresses then typically the system software translates these virtual addresses to physical addresses. And uh, so far, all these, uh, sorry. Uh, so the, then these physical memory addresses is mapped to uh, some logical addresses in, uh, of DRAM channel, rank, bank, row, column, right? And uh, so far, all these address translations are visible within the processor itself. However, uh, there is an additional uh, address translation that takes place in the DRAM chip itself called in DRAM mapping. And uh, here uh, it, it, it gets the uh, logical addresses and maps them to actual physical rows and columns. <clears throat> so uh, DRAM manufacturers or vendors apply this in DRAM mapping for two reasons. The first reason is uh, design optimizations uh, to simplify DRAM circuitry to provide better density, performance, and power. And the second uh, reason is uh, improving the yield by mapping faulty rows and columns to redundant ones. So this in-DRAM mapping scheme includes insights into chip designs and the manufacturing quality. And that's why uh, DRAM manufacturers prefer to keep it as proprietary information and they do not share it. So when we look at all these four high-level row hammer mitigation approaches, actually, uh, we, we should look at two of them here, uh, namely physical isolation and reactive refresh mechanisms. They, uh, these two high-level approaches uh, intrinsically need to identify victim or isolation rows uh, in, in, in each of them to, uh, require, uh, uh, to, to, to be able to understand like uh, when, uh, when a row hammer attack is happening, uh, which rows should we allocate for isolation or which rows we need to refresh. And uh, this definitely requires this proprietary knowledge and uh, they, we do not access to this knowledge basically. Uh, okay, uh, our goal in this work is to prevent row hammer efficiently and scalably without knowledge or, of, or modifications to DRAM internals. And uh, I will, uh, based on this, I will start explaining block hammer now. So the block hammer's key idea is to selectively throttle memory accesses that may cause row hammer bit flips. And uh, block hammer consists of two mechanisms, namely row blocker and attack throttler. Row blocker tracks row activation rates using area efficient Coulomb filters. Blacklist rows that are activated at a high rate throttles or enforces a certain delay between uh, activations targeting a blacklisted row. Uh, by doing so, RoboLocker ensures that no row can be activated at a high enough rate to induce row hammer bit flips. And uh, this, the second part of the mechanism, attack throttler, it identifies uh, threats that try activating blacklisted rows and reduces their memory bandwidth consumption by throttling their memory requests. And by doing so, attack throttler greatly reduces the performance degradation and energy wastage a row hammer attack inflicts on a system. I will explain how RoBlocker works next. Uh, so RoBlocker uh, modifies the memory request scheduler to throttle row activations that could lead to bit flips. To do so, it blacklists rows with high activation rates and delays subsequent, activating, uh, activate, subsequent activations targeting them. And uh, we call the blacklisting logic uh, RoBlocker BL or blacklist and the delay in logic RoBlocker HB. HB stands for history buffer. Um, to throttle row activations with a high activation rate, RoboLocker blocks a row activation if the row is both blacklisted and recently activated. And uh, in this slide, uh, I'll explain how RoboLocker operates in high level. 
So the first uh, memory request scheduler pings row blocker with uh, is the row activation row hammer safe uh, request or query before perform before performing the row activation, and uh, uh, row blocker uh, simultaneously checks uh, both of these structures. If a row is blacklisted and recently activated, then it returns a signal saying that row hammer uh, th th this request is row hammer unsafe. So uh, if if uh, this is the case, memory request scheduler does not. Uh, issue the row activation, and uh, the the activation is blocked basically. And uh, meanwhile, this activation is blocked. Uh, there are uh, there are probably other requests waiting in the queue, and they're uh, being serviced as usual. So uh, when the memory request scheduler issues a row activation, eventually, both components are updated with the row activation information basically. Okay, so uh, let's uh, dive into the blacklisting logic. Row blocker BL or the blacklisting logic tracks row activation rates and blacklists a row when its activation count in a time window exceeds the threshold. So to do this in an area efficient way, it employs two counting bloom filters, which are area efficient uh, counting structures. So uh, I'll explain how a counting bloom filter uh, works in, in our mechanism, basically. So a counting balloon filter is essentially an array of counters here. And uh, we uh, address these counters using some hash functions. And when a row A is activated, its row ID is provided to a set of hash functions that evaluate a set of indices to counter array, and each of which is uh, incremented one. Uh, when we activate another row, row B, uh, it increments another subset of counters. But uh, as you see here, uh, so this is not like perfectly uh, uh, distinct. And uh, there can be some overlaps uh, uh, for different row IDs. Uh, the, the, these hash functions can map to some uh, particular counters. And uh, they are incremented more than uh, the actual value. So <clears throat> the, the, that's one uh, limitation of the uh, Bloom filters, basically. Uh, so the, therefore, uh, we can uh, observe a row's activation count uh, more than uh, it is its actual value that leads to false positives. Uh, and uh, when we uh, when we want to estimate uh, a row's activation count, we look at uh, we test row A, uh, which uh, again goes through the same hash functions and then uh, addresses these counters. So we get the uh, a minimum value among these counter values and get the activation count based on that. So since we do not decrement uh, these counters at any time, uh, they're just incrementing, uh, we cannot observe uh, activation count value less than its actual value. So there's no false negatives here. Uh, but uh, since we do not decrement them, now we have another challenge. Uh, these counters can saturate because they are not like uh, infinitely large. And uh, we use a time interleaving approach and we use we employ two counting balloon filters to periodically reset them without losing information that I will explain that next. So, uh, okay, so blacklist and logic employs two counting balloon filters. And uh, any row activation is inserted in both filters at all times. Uh, but only, only uh, one of these filters responds to test queries at a given time. And we call that filter active filter, and the other filter is passive filter. And uh, the active filter alternates at uh, every epoch uh, between these two filters. And uh, let's look at the operation of two filters, uh, CBFA and CBFB, across the time across the timeline shown here. So uh, yeah, we, we see CBFA and CBFB here. <clears throat> so let's say a green bar indicates a green bar indicates that uh, a balloon filter is active at this given epoch, and uh, we we use the gray bar uh, to indicate that it's passive. Uh, so. Only one of them is active at a given epoch. So let's start with the uh, from from the beginning. Uh, so uh, we start as like CBFA is active and does not blacklist the row for the first uh, 
first some number of activations until the activation count reaches a threshold that we call the lightlessness threshold. Uh, okay. Uh, at time stamp, okay. Yeah. So row blocker blightless a row if the row's activation count reaches uh, this value, basically. And uh, assume now that uh, the, the row, so this is for uh, one single row, right? That what we are showing here. Assume that the row is uh, activated at a high rate in, in this first two epochs and uh, at a low rate in, in the third epoch. And uh, uh, we, okay, so we start from the uh, beginning and uh, we, we keep activating the row. And uh, this blue bar shows that, the, this, this blue bar shows that uh, the, the row is not uh, lightlisted yet. But at uh, timestamp two, the row's activation count reaches actually the blacklisting threshold, and we start blacklisting the row. And uh, from now on, uh, this red bar shows that the row's counter exceeds MBL uh, or blacklisting threshold, so that we we keep uh, blacklisting threshold until the end of uh, we we keep blacklisting the row until the end of the epoch. And uh, when we reach the uh, timestamp three. The active filter CBFA is cleared, or like all counters of this uh, balloon filter is reset to zero. And we switch to uh, uh, CBFB, the other uh, balloon filter. And now this filter is responding our uh, test queries. And uh, this filter is not reset at this point, right? And uh, it remembers the activations from epoch one. So it keeps <clears throat> blacklisting the row until the end of epoch two, because uh, the, black, the, the row's activation count also exceeded the blacklisting threshold based on the CBFB's records. And at CBF four, uh, at timestamp four, let's say uh, we, we keep activating the row, right? And uh, CBFA's counters were zero at this point, and then it, it remained uh, at blue, uh, uh, up to some level, and then at timestamp four, CBFA's counters also exceed uh, this blacklist and threshold. So it also, uh, when tested, it also says that we need to blacklist this, this row. Uh, and uh, let's move to this timestamp five. Uh, at the end of epoch two, uh, we clear uh, CBFB as well. So we reset all the counters to zero. And now we switch back to CBFA. And CBFA keeps blacklisting the row again because, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, its counters exceeded MBL at timestamp four. And uh, uh, yeah, remember we assume that the row is not activated at a high rate at epoch three. So uh, uh, CBFB's uh, counters do not exceed uh, uh, the blacklisting threshold until the end of epoch three, uh, even though the row is blacklisted during epoch three. And then finally, we switch back to uh, CBFB at timestamp six. The row is not blacklisted anymore because uh, based on CBFB's records, uh, it, is, it, is not, it is not supposed to be blacklisted. So this is basically how we uh, switch between these two counter, counting balloon filters and uh, sustain uh, the security guarantee of no false negatives uh, by while resetting some counters here and avoiding saturation. <clears throat> so to ensure row hammer safe operation, row blocker limits the activation rate of blacklisted rows at a row hammer safe level, right? And uh, an activation rate is row hammer safe if uh, if it is smaller than or equal to row hammer threshold uh, or and B and and RH activations here. You can also think of it as like HC first activations in a refresh window uh, based on like different papers, different terminology. Um, so row blocker limits the activation count uh, of, or, or uh, yeah, row blocker limits the activation count of a row uh, to uh, NCBF in a CBF. Uh, so yeah, so here what we see, uh, as what we say by lifetime is 
So we clear CBF A here, for example, in this point, and then we clear again at that point. So this is the lifetime of a CBF, and uh, row blocker limits the activation count uh, of a row to some uh, value in, in this uh, CBF time uh, window. And as long as uh, this activation count uh, uh, to this time window uh, ratio is, uh, or when we say like activation rate uh, is uh, below the raw hammer threshold, then we are safe, right? So uh, mathematically, we can actually express it like this. So I don't want to get into math too much here in this presentation. You can check the paper. Uh, we have a section about security analysis. And we can talk more and go through these steps uh, one by one uh, later, uh, uh, other like at other time other than later. But uh, yeah, for now you can just uh, say that okay, if my activation count and CBF in a TCBF uh, time window is smaller than NRH activations in a TRFW or refresh window, uh, we are raw hammer safe. And to sustain that. Uh, so again, we have a timeline here uh, of t uh, as wide as a, a bloom filters uh, lifetime, and uh, we 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 can fit like NCBF row activations here, and uh, let's see how this delay logic works uh, based on this history buffer. So we have like very frequent row activations, right? In the worst case, we can have a row activation at every TRC uh, time. And uh, this is specified by the uh, DRAM standards, basically. Um, so <clears throat> to reach uh, the blacklist and uh, threshold and BL, uh, the, the soonest time or shortest time we can reach this blacklist and threshold is TRC times MBL, basically. And uh, when we reach to MBL row activations, now after this point, until the end of this uh, time window, uh, we have uh, this much of time, TCBF minus TRC times TMBL, right? And uh, uh, I uh, as I showed like in the previous slide, uh, at after this point, we basically blacklist the row. So what are we going to do with the blacklisted rows? This is the question. Uh, we show a blacklisted row activation in red color here. And what we do is basically we introduce, uh, we enforce a delay between the row activations here. So uh, up to this, this level, uh, uh, we, we allow the row to be activated as, many, as frequently as possible, basically. But after it is blacklisted, now we uh, enforce this T delay uh, such that uh, the total number of activations is not gonna exceed the row hammer threshold. And to uh, ensure that, we can basically uh, compute this T delay uh, based on this formula here, because it is the number of activations over there, and uh, we have MBL activations here. So this total thing should not exceed row hammer threshold, and as we increase T delay, we can have less number of activations. So this is the knob that we are playing with uh, to throttle the row, row activations, basically. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I think uh, I explained everything here, unless you have questions. No, okay. Okay, so uh, row blocker, HB or history buffer ensures that no subsequent blacklisted row activations perform sooner than this T delay time window. And to do so, it implements a history buffer that contains the information of all row activations that can fit in a T delay time window. And uh, a blacklisted row activation is uh, blocked as long as a valid activation record of the row exists in the history buffer. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what row blocker does is it queries this history buffer, right? And if it can find a record uh, that is valid, uh, it means that uh, we already activated this row in the past T delay time window. So we should blacklist it because it is not row hammer safe if the row is uh, uh, blacklisted we should uh, block this row activation. So uh, with this mechanism, uh, no row can be activated at a high enough rate to induce row hammer bit flips. So we uh, deterministically ensure that uh, uh, no row can exceed this threshold. Okay, so 
Uh, I cover draw blocker and I'll uh, quickly cover attack throttler, hopefully. Uh, attack throttler tackles the performance degradation and energy wastage that the raw hammer attack causes. And to identify and reduce the negative impact of raw hammer attack, uh, uh, attack throttler leverages the observation that a raw hammer attack intrinsically keeps activating blacklist throws. That's the ultimate goal of raw hammer attack, right? Uh, because uh, it cannot induce bit flips without activating blacklisted throws. Uh, to this end, attack throttle introduces a new metric called uh, raw hammer likelihood index. And uh, this is basically the number of activations that uh, target blacklisted throws normalized to the maximum possible activation count. And uh, <clears throat> uh, if we look at the value that this raw hammer likelihood index can get, uh, for benign applications uh, that do not bl uh, activate blacklisted row activate blacklisted rows, this value is basically zero, and it reaches to one if uh, uh, if a row hammer attack is uh, uh, running on a system basically, because now uh, we we reach to the row hammer threshold when it's one right because we uh, perform blacklisted row activations as much as we can. And uh, if there is no block hammer in the system, then you can even exceed one. Uh, you can perform more activations. So uh, the conclusion of this slide basically is raw hammer likelihood is index is larger when the th threads access pattern is more similar to a raw hammer attack. And now we use this as a metric to identify the raw hammer attack threads. Uh, so attack throttler applies a smaller quota to a thread's in-flight request count as RHLI increases. So if the uh, thread is benign, then uh, uh, we do not apply any quota, basically. And if the raw hammer attack uh, uh, is running and it reaches to like uh, this, this kind of raw hammer likelihood index, then uh, when it reaches one, then after this point, we do not allow any request from this thread. Basically, we just like stop the thread over there. And uh, by doing so, uh, block hammer or attack throttle reduces a raw hammer attack's memory bandwidth consumption. And this enables a larger memory bandwidth to concurrently run in benign applications. And uh, by doing so, it greatly reduces the performance degradation and energy wastage a raw hammer attack inflicts on a system. And the raw hammer likelihood can uh, optionally be used as a raw hammer attack indicator by the system software if you have some other sophisticated malware detection systems and stuff, you can uh, flag them saying that, oh, this thread is doing something wrong. Okay, yeah, this is basically what the mechanism is and uh, I'll move on to evaluation. So first uh, we analyze and compare block hammer's hardware complexity uh, with six state-of-the-art raw hammer mitigation mechanisms, namely uh, para, pro hit, MR lock, CBT, twice, and graphene. So we calculate the hardware complexity in terms of area, access energy, and static power consumption. And uh, we use a, a realistic raw hammer threshold of 32K uh, of the time. And uh, uh, yeah, we observe that block hammer is, uh, uh, it can be considered as a low cost mechanism and it is competitive with the state of the art counter-based mechanisms, which are CBT twice and graphene. And uh, to understand how hardware complexity uh, of block hammer and the other mechanisms scale with worsening raw hammer vulnerability, we repeat the analysis for a raw hammer threshold of uh, 1K. So we extremely uh, decrease the raw hammer threshold here. I think uh, so far among the chips we characterize, I, I don't remember any raw hammer threshold that is as small as 1K. So this is really uh, some like uh, future looking uh, kind of analysis. Uh, yeah, this we, we project this for the future chips. And uh, we compare how the complexity of each mechanism changes in terms of chip area. Uh, yeah, here's chip area, access energy, and static power consumption. And we observe that block hammer's hardware complexity scales more efficiently than uh, state-of-the-art raw hammer mitigation mechanisms. And block hammer, yeah, okay, I, al I was already said that. So uh, as the second step of evaluation, uh, we conduct cycle level simulations using Remulator and DRAM power. 
uh, to uh, evaluate the performance and DRAM energy consumption. And uh, we simulate a realistic system with a DDR4 DRAM module uh, that is specified here. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, we uh, we uh, evaluate our system with uh, this uh, set of uh, single core benign work workloads uh, that, in that include uh, some spec CPU benchmarks, uh, some uh, YCSB disk area requests, some network accelerator traces, and some uh, synthetic traces that performs bulk data copy with non-temporal hint. Uh, so uh, on top of that, we use uh, we 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 randomly choose uh, a set of these single core benign workloads and run them together as eight core uh, multi-threaded uh, multi-programmed workloads. And uh, we randomly generate like 125 workloads that contain eight benign applications. And we also uh, analyze another 125 workloads that each of which contain seven benign applications and uh, one row of hammer attack thread. So we started evaluating for single core benign workloads. And we, uh, we classify single core workloads into three categories based on their row, row buffer conflicts uh, per kilo instruction. And we evaluate the performance and DRAM energy consumption for block hammer and six state of the art row hammer mitigation mechanisms, basically. And we observe that no application's row activation count exceeds block hammer's blacklisting threshold when it's run in single thread. And therefore, block hammer does not change the performance or DRAM energy consumption for single core benign applications. So it's similar to some other uh, state-of-the-art mechanisms, uh, uh, yeah, the, the overhead is uh, pr practically zero. Uh, and uh, things get more interesting when we evaluate the, these mechanisms with multi-programmed workloads, eight-core workloads. Uh, uh, so we conduct this test when there is no row hammer attack, as I said earlier, and uh, when there is a row hammer attack is present. So we use four metrics in this evaluation to demonstrate the system throughput uh, in terms of weighted speed up and uh, uh, job turnaround time in terms of uh, harmonic speed up, uh, unfairness in terms of maximum slowdown and DRAM energy consumption at the very end. So these are the values basically. Uh, okay, so here, uh, we, we, we conclude that when there is no attack in the system, block hammer introduces very low performance and DRAM energy overheads. And these are the numbers that uh, I just uh, pulled from the paper. Uh, you can see more detailed results over there. And uh, when there's a row hammer attack present, uh, then block hammer significantly increases benign applications performance by uh, for the five percent on average, and reduces the DRAM energy consumption by twenty nine percent on average, and this is all because of uh, throttling the uh, malicious raw hammer attack thread uh, without affecting the other uh, applications, uh, and other mechanisms don't do this. So we conduct a scalable to study with worsening raw hammer vulnerability here, again for the cases when there is no raw hammer attack and when there is a raw hammer attack present. And we scale the Rohammer threshold from 32K to 1K on the x-axis. You can see the, how the Rohammer threshold changes. And here are the results for system throughput, job turnaround time, unfairness, and DRAM energy consumption. So we observe that block hammer's performance and energy overheads remain negligible, even when Rohammer threshold is scaled down to 1K. And uh, block hammers scalable to provide much higher performance and lower energy consumption than state-of-the-art mechanisms uh, when there is a row hammer attack present. So uh, we have more analysis in the paper, including uh, a security proof where we mathematically represent all possible access patterns and show that no row can be activated at a high enough rate to induce bit flips when block hammer is configured correctly. Second, the paper explains uh, how block hammer addresses many sided attacks by tuning its thresholds. Third, we evaluate all four high level row hammer mitigation approach through analyzing 14 mechanisms. Uh, you can see over there in the second column uh, from four aspects, uh, comprehensive protection, compatibility with commodity DRAM chips, scalability with worsening row hammer vulnerability and deterministic protection. 
And we show that block hammer is the only mechanism that satisfies all of them based on the criteria we explain here. So to conclude, uh, this paper tackles raw hammer as a worst in the RAM reliable chance security problem. While state of the art raw hammer mitigation mechanisms face limitations, supporting uh, current and future DRAM chips due to limited scalability with worsening raw hammer vulnerability and limited compatibility with commodity DRAM chips. So the goal of this work is to efficiently and scalably prevent raw hammer bit flips without knowledge of or modifications to DRAM internals. And our key idea is uh, uh, to selectively throttle memory accesses that may cause raw hammer bit flips. And our mechanism block hammer performs three operations to achieve this. Uh, it tracks raw activation rates uh, uh, of all rows using area efficient balloon filters. <clears throat> it throttles raw activations that could lead to raw hammer bit flips. And it identifies and throttles the threads that perform raw hammer attacks. And we evaluate block hammer scalability with worsening raw hammer and demonstrate that block hammer is competitive with state of the art raw hammer mitigation mechanisms when there is no attack in the system. And block hammer provides significantly higher performance and lower DRAM energy consumption when a raw hammer attack is present. Uh, also, we, uh, we uh, Look, uh, look at block hammer's uh, compatibility, uh, and we, we show that block hammer is compatible with current and future commodity DRAM chips because it does not require uh, any proprietary information of DRAM internals or modifications to DRAM circuitry. So, this is basically what block hammer is. And yeah, I can take your questions now if there's any. Right. I guess a point to the evaluation, you show that even with 1,000 uh, hammer threshold, you only have like some uh, 0.7x uh, weight speed up, right? I think that's roughly I the can number. go over. Which plot are you talking about? So, oh, okay, no, that's not even. So you we show almost no, no slowdown, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think past Rohammer papers talk about some workloads which almost, like benign workloads which almost exhibit naturally a block hammer, a uh, row hammer uh, behavior, right? So, uh, which, which paper is that? Did you say? I, some, some pre, it might be, I don't know, like the, the um, row hammer in, in, in like looking back at row hammer, I don't know what it's called anymore. I see. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think it highly depends how you configure your system as well. So, uh, for a benign application to reach to that hammer count, actually, uh, your uh, first, your raw buffer locality should be terrible, for example. And uh, it also depends on how you map your uh, raw uh, data into different DRAM rows, columns, banks, and stuff, right? And uh, so here, what we use is basically like state-of-the-art configuration uh, used for improving raw buffer locality. And uh, in this configuration, we basically, uh, how can I say that? So it, it's not like just sequentially writing the data into, uh, the, into a different row from beginning to end, for example. So you put a bunch of data in some place in a row, and then you move to another bank, and then put some, some other data over there. It's called like interleaving. You can do this interleaving in like cache line granularity or like several cache line granularities. And uh, we also apply this mechanism called, um, what was it? I guess minimalistic open page. Uh, so uh, uh, based on the row ID, you also change the sorting of these uh, data uh, in different banks. So uh, one row goes from like bank zero, then bank one, then bank two, for example. And another row goes like bank two, bank five, bank zero, something like that. And this is what is shown to be uh, good for improving row buffer locality. And it is implemented in like many systems today. So uh, when we use that kind of configuration, we do not observe that uh, any of these benign applications reach into Raw hammer threshold, basically. Uh, but if if we don't apply these techniques, then yeah, we we, we can observe those. Uh, yeah, I, I did that analysis, so I can confidently say that. <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, so you can still argue that there can be some benign applications that uh, maybe reach to that threshold, but we do not test here, right? Because we cannot test like every single application in the world. And yeah, if, if you can find that paper and share it with me, that would be really great, actually. Uh, I'd like to reproduce the results. Yeah, thanks for the answer. I, it was either mentioned in the lecture or in one of the papers, but I'm, I really have no, no idea where anymore. <laughs> okay, okay. I think I've, I've heard it as well from Onu. Like, I think he talked about, like, he saw some applications exhibiting, like, some row hammer uh, <laughs> behavior or something. I don't know if he wants to jump in. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess you can observe some, like, behavior of, like, activating the same row again and again. So if, uh, may maybe you can be remembering that from, I don't know, works like crow maybe or charge cache so the, there's a, a behavior called a row buffer temporal locality sort of row level temporal locality and over there uh, it's it's some like observed trend that you when an application actually activates a row there is a high chance that it's going to activate the same row again in like near future and you can actually consider that as like hammering right uh, yeah, but yeah, in my experience, I, I didn't see like they reach to like up to row hammer threshold because for row hammer, you need to reach some large hammer count in a very short amount of time. But in this kind of behavior that I explained about like row level temporal locality, usually you see like this row is being activated in, I, I don't know, in the next microsecond or something like that. I don't know if anybody remembers from the uh, audience, maybe. <laughs> Other questions? Like, this kind of seems too good to be true, actually, this paper. <laughs> like, is this going to be implemented then? Because it really seems like there's no, like, there's no bad side right well uh, it is not cheap right um, uh, so uh, so here I showed some area complexity for example uh, hardware complexity so uh, it is one of the like drawbacks of this mechanism I would say uh, I mean nothing is I mean there, there's no free lunch anyway <laughs> so you need to pay for some area uh, or energy you know, those kind of things. And uh, I don't know, it, it can be implemented in the real systems. Uh, based on our analysis, it's, it seems like it's, 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 it works really good. Um, yeah, but for sure, we don't know what they implement, right? Uh, and this is just published in like early 2021, in like March or so. Uh, I wouldn't expect to see this in real systems this soon, I guess. Yeah, it depends on your constraints, I guess, as the processor designer. So it can be like just a little thing to pay or it can be too large, I don't know. I guess the burden is then on who, who has the burden of implementing this then? So we propose this as a, a completely memory controller based mechanism, right? So memory controller is uh, placed in the processor die so it, it would be like, let's say Intel or AMD, you know, those kind of companies should be implementing this. But there's also another trend in the industry. So when you go ask the DRAM manufacturers, they say that, oh, there's no need for this because, you know, our chips are like raw hammer free. We do the all security precautions and stuff. And then uh, Hassan comes and hacks all of them. So. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I guess that's the end then.